It is that time of the show when we say hello to today's guest, and we are joined by a fascinating gentleman, a scientist and climatologist from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We are joined by Bill Patzert. And Bill, you know, this is such a timely uh, event for you to be here because we're in the middle of a major drought and people are questioning it, what's causing it. You know, it's like we've never had a dry spell in California before. But, you know, give us a little bit of your experience. What, what's going on and what can we expect? And, you know, we're, we're dying of thirst and on the East Coast they're freezing to death. Well, Ron, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, you know, I've been uh, studying water for almost 40 years here in California. And uh, this drought that we've entered this year, which, by the way, started about a decade ago, is uh, the most punishing thing that I've seen. Records in terms of lack of water are dropping like horseflies. All right, so it started about a decade ago, um, and we just didn't notice it, or we had enough water reserves that covered it. You know, why is why are we feeling the pinch now? Well, you know, there are 20 million of us in Southern California, and uh, from San Diego to Santa Barbara, we import either from the Colorado, the Owens Valley or the Sacramento Bay Delta, 70% of our water. And so we have water infrastructure like no place else in the world. And so uh, there aren't many short showers. And unfortunately, a lot of my neighbors are watering five days a week, right in the middle of this drought. Because of this great water infrastructure, it's unique and the belief that we'll always have enough water. So I wanna talk about ways to conserve, but first, you know, let's talk about how droughts have been happening on the West Coast, you know, for millennia. So it, it's not like it's a real shock. This is, I guess, a cyclical kind of event? Well, I always say, you know, we call it the Golden State. I always call it the Brown State. When you fly- Oh, because of our governor? <laughs> because of our governor, <laughs> and as you fly over, the brown state, you look down, it's always brown. And when you fly from here to the East Coast, it doesn't get green until you hit the Mississippi. And so we're living in a semi-arid region here in the American West. And so drought is the rule, not the exception. But uh, you know, the population center of the country has switched from the Midwest and the Northeast into the southeast and the American West. And so now the pressure on the water supply is extreme. And when we look back on our history, our history is one long story of drought after drought after drought. It's a dry place. And here we are once again in the throes of a great drought. Last time we saw this was the 1950s and the 1960s. But back then, there were only 10 million people in Southern California. Now the pressure is greater. So is this just a case of us being asleep at the wheel? Rather than waiting until it's really become a problem, we should be more conservation conscious either earlier or all the time because we know that one drought is gonna be eventually followed by another one. That's right. But uh, you know, it's a catch 22 because uh, the water business in the state of California is a multi-billion dollar business. And so if they allocate water to water districts here in Southern California, they wanna sell it to you, all right? They don't wanna store it, or worse yet, flush it out into the ocean. And so as long as the water is available, they wanna sell it. And then when it's not available, then we all have to turn off the water faucets and turn on our conservation consciousness. That's right, then we'll conserve. And uh, more than likely, the real solution, of course, would be to increase the water bill, tiered pricing in water, mm -hmm. which you're already really starting to see. But, uh, you know, that uh, belies the real fact. Uh, across the state, many communities are not hooked up to the great metropolitan water district and the supplies from the Colorado mountain communities, uh, dry land farmers, uh, ranchers all over the state. And uh, a lot of people are really in pain. So a lot of ranchers are going under and a lot of farmland in the state of California is going fallow. 
in communities that are not hooked up to the great infrastructure, some of them are looking at three months of water remaining. Wow. All right, and then the faucet goes dry. So it's not as sweet for everybody as it is for us here in the greater Los Angeles area. But at some point, unless this drought ends soon or we discover some unknown water source, we're creeping in that direction, is that right? Well, you know, historically, we've seen great droughts. In the 11th century, there was a 100-year drought in the American West. In the 19, from the mid-1940s to the early 1970s, it was very, very dry. Of course, there were a lot less of us. And uh, I contend we're in the 13th year of this drought. Okay. It's just gone critical. Well, let's hold that. We're going to come back after a brief break and talk about some of the ways we can start to conserve so that we don't turn on the tap and find nothing there. The best part of this conversation is yet to come. We'll be right back. You are watching or listening to Ron Stark, The Voice, coming to you from the beautiful KGEM studios in Old Town, Monrovia. And we are joined by Bill Patzert, who is a climatologist scientist at JPL. And we've been talking about the water situation in California and why we're where we are. But now I'd like to change gears and talk a little bit about what we can do about it, how we as consumers as the people who live here, what can we do to start saving water? Well, there are a lot of us living here, and there are a lot of water constituents. There are the urban, suburban users, agricultural users, and don't forget we have to allocate a certain amount of water to environmental things like the health of the ecosystems in the Bay Delta and the rivers in California. And to make it even more complex, there's a new boy on the block, and he's called fracking, oh. which is a heavy water user. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everybody's going to have to give here. Now, since most of your listeners are city dwellers, all right, more than 60 to 70 percent of your water is used in your yard, mm -hmm. all right? And on average, we overwater our yards by six feet a year. And so we can definitely turn off those sprinklers shorter, fewer days a week, or even better, switch out our grass yards into something that's more eco-friendly and more normal in California, all right? And, and the other thing in our homes, the big water hogs are dishwashers, mm -hmm. showers, all right? Washing machines, all right? So I don't wanna see any more half loads in that dishwasher right. and that washing machine. And you can definitely, when you brush your teeth in the shower, turn the water off while you're doing it, mm -hmm. all right? We, uh, you know, we got very comfortable with nice long showers. I like them myself, you know? Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, they're definitely water wasters. Well, and there's an added benefit to that. Not only are you helping conserve water for the future, but you're saving some money. And right now, who doesn't want to do that? If you could cut your water bill by 25 to 30 percent, right. Why wouldn't you do it? You know, well, part of water conservation will be tiered pricing. So the more water you use, the more you will pay. But, uh, you know, everybody has to do their part. You know, uh, the farmers, which uh, they use, by the way, 70% of the water in the state of I California. I would have guessed they're the biggest 70%. users. And just for uh, contrast, they're actually only 3% of the state's economy, which is some people are surprised with that. But there are some very water intensive crops, cotton, rice, nuts, all right? And uh, all the fruit and nut trees are very water intensive. And so we have to think about exactly what we grow in the state of California, all right? Yeah, well, so I would say- that could be a tough call for the farmers who have for generations maybe been growing the same items. Absolutely, no, well actually they've gone to things that uh, are more profitable and mostly that are exported yeah. overseas. Almonds, rice, cotton, all right? So most more profit, of that ends up higher in- water use. Yeah, most of that ends up in China, all right? But they're high water usage items. And then, uh, and then this guy fracking, all right? We really have to think about this because it's a double-edged sword. Not only do they use a lot of water in fracking, the potential of contaminating 
what drinkable water we have in our aquifers and our groundwater systems, whether we contaminate that. And so that's a whole new dimension to mm -hmm. the water problem. And so Governor Brown definitely got his hands full here. Right. Yeah, how do you balance, that's, isn't that always the issue? How do we balance living a reasonable life with conserving and finding that kind of balance place in between? Well, you know, we have to live within our limits. And when you look back on human history, the limiting factor in almost all human civilizations have been population, all right, exacerbated by great droughts. Mm -hmm. And a good example actually was the 100 year drought in the 11th century, which caused the Anastasi civilization in the American Southwest to disperse. And so, uh, you know, I'm not prophesizing the demise of Southern California civilization, but I am definitely telling you we will have to change our ways. And at the end of the day, if pricing structures start to change, that will force change one way or the other. And life is always evolving and we need to evolve with it. Yeah, we've, we've had uh, the 1980s and the 1990s were two of the wettest decades in the history of California. Wow. All right. And we built most of our civilization, agriculture, industry, which is very diversified during this very, very wet period in California history. But now we might be looking at another 10, 20 years. That long of much drier conditions, and that's what we've seen in the past. Okay. Right? Well, Bill, let me ask you this. If someone wanted to get more information on anything we've talked about or get a hold of you, is there a way they can do it? Yeah, so, you know, just Google me, Patsert, uh, you know, and on uh, Google News, and uh, I'm there for you. Uh, the, there's a lot of really interesting work being done at NASA and at JPL on this, and uh, we definitely, uh, be willing to talk to anybody. All right, terrific. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to having you back on in the future to keep us updated on what's going on in our climate and our world. Don't go away, we will be right back. Yes, this is from the uh, Rise of the Rooster Strut. It's the headgear and it was inspired by native fashions. Um, and it's made from an old bicycle helmet, a pair of high-heeled shoes, the tips of a woman's high-heeled shoes, uh, gloves, the tail, and the ears of Clifford the Red Dog. Um, and here is the waddle. So this is Rise of the Rooster Strut. Now, design. this is from year one. And am mm -hmm. I right in assuming there was more to the, to the outfit? Yes, a man, a man wore it and uh, Everything was made out of palms and natural items on the, on the body. And long um, feathers, the, the rooster tail feathers, were all made out of uh, the palm leaves that uh, and were. And even had feet, you know, rooster looking wow. feet with yeah. duct tape. And, and, and for anyone, and I hope our viewers and listeners will actually come out. Temecula is not that far, and Monte Doro is a, is a wonderful winery. 